to the webinar, A Learner-Centered Approach to Teaching and Learning. Today, we're going to be discussing ways in which student-centered learning can truly benefit learners and lead to deep and meaningful learning experiences. Everyone has their own idea of what a student-centered classroom looks like, and I'm sure that there are many aspects that we can all agree upon. Aspects such as quality learning, less teacher talking time, and student engagement may be difficult concepts to discuss, but with a little bit of preparation and knowledge, they do not have to be so difficult to actually put into practice. I'd like to start by giving you a short introduction to who I am and what I do and what I believe qualifies me to speak on this topic of student-centeredness. My name is Professor Sean Daly. I have a BA in history from UC Riverside. I have an MA in education from the TESOL program at California State University, San Bernardino. And I have collectively over 13 years of teaching experience, both in California, but principally in EFL at all levels here in South Korea, where I live. I have over two years of experience in teacher training at Westcliff University, and I currently teach English as a foreign language at Hansei University here, very close to Seoul, South Korea. I'm also a language student of Spanish, Korean, and Italian. And finally, I'm an active member and volunteer for the Seoul chapter of the Korea TESOL organization, which is also known as CoTESOL. TESOL is an acronym for Teaching English to Students of Other Languages. And my contact information is there if you would have any other questions or anything that you'd like to discuss about this webinar. So I'd like to start by asking you to watch a couple of short video clips of teachers in the classroom. I'd like you to try to notice the teaching style of the instructors and the engagement level of the students. Try to picture yourself as a student in these classrooms and think about how you would feel if you were there and involved in the teaching and learning that is happening. This first video clip may or may not already be familiar to you. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone? Great Depression passed the, anyone, anyone, the tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work. And this next clip is of a very different classroom with different students and try to compare and contrast what you saw in the first video with what you will see here. What kind of learning is happening? Who is involved in the processes and the activities? In which classroom would you like to learn and why? Try to forget about any preconceived notions of what you think the role of the teacher is or should be, and take on the perspective of the student who is motivated to learn. I kind of like relate it to walking through a dark room and once you find the light switch and you hit it, then you're like, I found the light switch. So today the students are having an authentic learning experience by building puzzles together. Uh, they're comparing two variables, time, and then how many puzzle pieces that they were able to connect. At the end of given time intervals, they'll then gather their data to create a scatter plot and construct a linear regression that best represents their data and can make judgments based off of that. What I like about this class is that she's teaching um, the basics and then we get to help figure out the details to it. And it really helps me like, understand the material and then memorize it when it comes to tests and using it later on. 
So our, our math tests aren't just, you're going After watching those two very different teachers in classrooms, I want to begin by asking you what learning content you were better able to remember, the content from the first video or from the second video? And why do you think that is? How would you classify these two very different types of classrooms? Which one might you label student-centered and which one might you label teacher-centered? In which video does it look as if the students are learning? If you said the second video, then of course you're correct. The banking model of education, where the teacher is seen as the source of knowledge and the student is seen as an empty vessel waiting to be filled with knowledge, is no longer the preferred method of teaching and learning because we now understand that deeper learning will occur with a different set of teaching practices, namely those methods and strategies that engage students. Of course, we are much better able to internalize something through these different methods of learning, what the teacher in the second video called an authentic learning experience. On the right side of this slide, you can see a graphic called the learning pyramid. It shows the approximate retention rates of learning for students through different teaching methods. In the first classroom that we saw, the teacher was mainly lecturing, and we can see that student retention rates will be less than 10% in that type of classroom. That's most likely why you saw the types of expressions that you did on the students' faces. In the second classroom that we saw, students were engaged in practice and most likely teaching each other a thing or two as well as they engaged in the activities. You can see that according to the chart, the average retention rate for knowledge in a classroom activity such as that would be much higher around 75%. So we can safely say that the students in the second video were learning much more than the students in the first. So you might now be asking yourself, how might you be able to create a classroom atmosphere where students are at the center of the learning and engaged, like the students you saw in the second video? Well, I hope that after you finish watching this webinar, you'll have a much better idea of how to accomplish that goal in your own classroom. One thing that we can say about the videos is that the amount of teacher talking time, or TTT, was very different. In a student-centered classroom, the goal of the teacher is to create more opportunities for the students to be doing the speaking so that they're more in charge of their own learning. In a language classroom, such as the one that I teach in here in Korea, this is vital to student learning because the more talking that I am doing, the less practice my students are getting in speaking the foreign language. Also, they have very limited opportunities to speak English outside of the classroom because the native language here in Korea is Korean. Students in America might have many more opportunities to speak English outside of the classroom, but the principles for student-centered learning remain the same. We want to give our students a place to practice in the classroom so that they can take what they've practiced and apply it to other situations when they walk out through those classroom doors and into the real world. It seems a little odd for me to be discussing student-centered learning in a webinar recording where I'm talking so much, but my goals today are to try to get you to understand what a student-centered learning experience looks like, to see some examples of how to go about implementing it in your own classrooms and various teaching contexts for better student outcomes, and to transfer to you some best practices or things to keep in mind when you're trying to apply these concepts to your individual teaching contexts. So I'd like to start with a case study of a course that I designed myself at Hansei University, where I currently teach here in South Korea. We usually teach English conversation classes and we teach English majors in our global education center. I've been in charge of teaching the English majors for about a year and a half now. And one thing that I noticed when I started teaching them in the program was their lack of conversation ability because I was in charge of teaching speaking practice and topic discussion courses, I thought I could just very easily find some topics for students to speak about 
and discuss in more depth and that student learning would ensue. However, I was wrong. Although the first two adaptations of our classes were successful to some extent, it became, soon became obvious to me that something needed to change so that students would become more engaged in the topics they were discussing and more motivated to learn and to speak both in and outside of the classroom. That's when what I call the epiphany happened. A friend of mine and textbook author, Gunther Bro, gave a talk at a Cotisol conference that I was attending. And he said something that really stuck with me throughout the rest of the conference. And that was, if the teacher is talking, then the students are not. And it came to me that the topics and the content and everything that I was introducing to my students, I had it all backwards. I needed to have the students bringing the material and topics into the classroom so that they would be more motivated to discuss things that they actually wanted to talk about and be able to learn more from each other. What Gunther did was have students talk with each other for a set amount of time about a certain topic and then change partners and do it all over again. Because students have a new partner in the conversation, it's different every time but the question and the topics are essentially the same. In this way, students get a lot more practice speaking and the teacher takes on a much less focused role as a facilitator or a coach to students who are having individual conversations. By the way, Gunther writes fantastic English language teaching textbooks that I highly recommend and I've left his websites here in case anybody is interested in purchasing any of his textbooks. So I was tasked with redesigning these two courses for our students so that students would learn more and be more interested in the content that they were learning. In the first iterations of our courses, teachers controlled the content and the results were mediocre. There was too much teacher talking time and not enough student talking time and students quickly lost interest in the content and in the conversations and discussions that we were having in class as a large group. So as teachers, we decided to change some things about the class. First, we made the students control the topics that we we're going to discuss in class. That means a student would choose a topic create a presentation, come into class, and actually teach us about the topic that they wanted to discuss. They would give us vocabulary words in advance and that students would write down in their vocabulary notebooks, and they would create their own discussion questions, which they would also give in advance to the rest of the students in the class. We also integrated some technology using Google Drive and some messaging apps that we used uh, to exchange the information with each other outside of class. And we use screencasts to give students step-by-step -step instructions on how to give presentations and some other aspects of the course as well. What we found was after we shifted the focus of the class from teachers to students, the students were more motivated to speak. They were more comfortable speaking in English, both inside and outside the classroom. And we found that there was a much deeper level of learning happening amongst our students. And if the students were happy in learning more, how do you think we felt as teachers? Another change that we made from the first version of the course to the second was that we included the same amount of reflection time, but we also integrated a type of assessment into the presentations that students were giving. Of course, this put more pressure on students to perform better presentations, but the results that we saw were fantastic. Students in their reflections noted to us that they were happier with being tasked with a project that is giving a presentation and being rewarded for their hard work on their results. And this kind of project-based learning is one key aspect of a student-centered classroom that we will discuss in a bit more detail in a few slides. So here, under group reflection, think, pair, share, you can see some of the things that students told us after they finished the course. They said things like, 
I have increased confidence or decreased anxiety in speaking English. I'm more comfortable speaking inside and outside the classroom. What we noticed as teachers was that they were making less grammatical errors in their speech and in their writing, and the vocabulary that they were using was more advanced. They were self-correcting themselves and getting key practice to develop automaticity in their real life conversation practice inside the classroom. One major thing I learned from this whole experience of developing a more student-centered classroom is the importance of experimentation. So a lot of teachers have this fear of losing control, but along with that fear comes this danger and that is getting too comfortable in a certain type of routine in your classroom. I've seen a lot of teachers becoming indifferent in their teaching practice and not pushing themselves or pushing their students to reach their full potential. One of the best things, in my opinion, that teachers can do to keep things fresh and original is to introduce new activities and keep the classroom student-centered to avoid teachers burning themselves out, trying to be the center of all the learning that is happening. Each time we introduced new activities in our classroom to our English majors, we used teacher modeling, and sometimes this was done through the use of screencasting. So technology can also be a very beneficial tool, and some of the different activities that we used in the classroom also included jigsaw activities, the student presentations and speed dating style conversation, uh, which I already mentioned, project-based learning and small group work. You have to remember to start small with your experimentation and work your way up. If you try to do too much too quickly, you're just gonna end up tiring yourself out and not getting the results that you wanted because your design suffered. So we looked at a few examples in our case study of what a student-centered classroom might look like. And now I'd like to show you some examples of student-centered teaching from some of the classes here at Westcliff University where I also teach. You can see the title of this next slide is Questions, Questions, Questions. When you're trying to create a student-centered classroom, you don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. You can use the tried and true teaching method that has been successful in getting students involved in learning for a long time. Discussion questions are some of the best ways to get students talking and engaged. Moreover, you can see some of my sample slides here from courses that I've taught and the types of questions and activities that I engage my students in. Reflection and group discussion using breakout rooms on Zoom or in pairs or in small groups in the classroom will facilitate more student talking time. When you're using discussion questions in your classroom, the best way to turn it to a student-centered conversation is to have the students discuss the questions with each other, either in pairs or in small groups, before you discuss as a larger group. If you're leading the discussion, that means that teacher talking time is increased and student talking time is decreased. You also must remember that with student-centered learning, students are learning from each other as well as from the teacher when they discuss topics that are relevant and applicable to them. So the key is to apply the course topics to what students already know and have already experienced. Students can bring a wealth of knowledge and experience into the classroom, and that is what makes each course and each teaching experience different from the next. Even though we are teaching the same materials, one class might vary drastically from another because of the makeup of the students and their unique backgrounds. Instead of a discussion moderator, the teacher becomes a facilitator helping students to engage with each other and asking the important questions. When a student asks a question to the professor 
about the topic or about the course content, the professor can then direct that question to the other students in the class and see what their answers are or what they think about it. This collective experience and problem solving in the classroom is what will lead to those more meaningful and authentic learning experiences. If you can remember back to the learning pyramid that we saw near the beginning of this webinar, you remember that students practicing, doing, and teaching others are the deepest level of retention on the learning pyramid. Students present topics to each other and apply their knowledge by teaching these concepts to each other. And that was the most beautiful aspect of our courses at Hansei University. Using this teaching method, you can truly engage your students in a more authentic and a deeper learning experience. Every class and every student is unique, so use this to your advantage with the different experiences and the different perspectives and perceptions that your students bring into the class. You have to share resources and tricks and tips and strategies with your students and encourage them to do the same with each other. In this activity slide from one of my lectures, you can see here, we have a shared Google Drive folder where students are able to share materials with each other, and I'm also able to share materials with them. And students are creating a presentation and presenting and explaining a technique from our weekly readings and discussion board posts to the rest of the class using Google Slides. This act of students teaching each other is at the deepest level of student learning retention on the learning pyramid and in your classroom. And this is what we mean by a truly student-centered learning experience. This open sharing of ideas and contexts and experiences is also like therapy for teachers. In the MA TESOL, TESOL program, we're teachers who are teaching and helping other teachers. So when we're able to put our heads together and brainstorm and come up with new ideas or share ideas and borrow them from each other, that level of experimentation that we talked about can easily work its way into the classroom, helping teachers to create that fresh and new learning experience where students are more engaged and more at the center of the learning. Finally, we're going to look at some best practices that you can keep in mind to try to implement when you are thinking about keeping your classes student-centered. So here is a short and by no means exhaustive list of some best practices for student-centered classrooms. The first is that student engagement is the most important aspect in this type of classroom. I cannot stress that fact enough. You need to have students engaging with each other in addition to engaging with the teacher. Keeping this in mind, the teacher does not always have to be in complete control. So don't be afraid to let the control go to the students in your classroom because they have knowledge and experience that they can bring into the classroom. And they have some of the most interesting content and perspectives for other students to learn from. When those perspectives enter into your classroom, teachers need to be ready and willing to accept them and that prior knowledge that the students bring. By honoring students and what they already know, we're giving them a sense of inclusion and autonomy that will also lead to greater learning experiences and deeper learning as students teach and talk about these experiences with their classmates. Another thing that will happen when students bring these experiences is that you will get to have a deeper and more meaningful relationship with your learners and by paying attention to their interests and experiences, you can find fresh and new ways to engage with them in the activities that you design. Finally, 
focusing on that enthusiasm and those interests that students bring into the classroom is the best way to guide your lessons because students will always be more interested in those concepts and topics that they have more experience with. For example, in my courses here in Korea at Hansei University, this is exactly what we found when we changed our classes to become more student-centered. Students were more interested in the topics and in the content of what was happening in class. One question that is important to this concept is how can we maintain this type of student-centered classroom over time? Well, as I said before, experimentation is a key aspect of keeping your teaching and learning experience fresh and new. And it's important to remember that this is only one teacher's experience. And although you don't have to reinvent the wheel, you can add your own spin. And the sky is truly the limit to what you want to achieve for your students. If you're busy making your own content and trying to redesign all of your own courses, you're going to get burned out. So use what successful teachers have used before you until you start to gain more comfort in developing and experimenting on your own. In my experience, when you implement somebody else's activity or idea into your classroom, you'll find that you naturally begin to manipulate that teaching strategy or method or technique into ways that enhance your own teaching style and benefit your students at the same time. Some of the method, methods that you can use that are more student-centered are seen here on the left side of this slide. They include inquiry-based learning, case-based instruction, problem-based learning, project-based learning, discovery learning, and also just-in-time teaching. And by no means is this list exhaustive. There are a multitude of ways to put students at the center of your classroom. Having students discuss and bring their own experiences and ideas into the discussion is the best and easiest way to get started on this journey of creating a more student-centered classroom. Remember that in a student-centered classroom, the benefits for the students is a much deeper and authentic learning experience. This is because students become in charge of their own learning and they become active instead of passive learners. Remember at the beginning of this presentation, we talked about less teacher talking time and more student talking time because the banking model of education is no longer seen as the best way for students to learn. Students can acquire knowledge and understanding on a much deeper level, and they gain the ability to teach these concepts to others in their professions or in other aspects of their lives. By becoming co-constructors of knowledge, students can learn from each other as well as from the teacher, and teachers can see and understand more about their students and become engaged with them in a way that promotes deeper learning. And there are incentives for everyone, not just in the classroom or in the educational context, but in the community in which the learning is taking place. We can see student empowerment, increased confidence, construction of knowledge, and students working together. And as teachers, you get to see the joy of watching your students grow and free yourself up to be a coach. That's the guide on the side rather than the, the sage on the stage. So I've always thought that one mark of a great teacher is that they're able to take something that they have seen or learned and adapt it to make it work for them in their particular classroom and teaching context. I hope that that's what you can do with what you've learned here today. I believe that each of you can apply these principles to your teaching context in ways that will benefit both you and your students by creating more student-centered classrooms that lead to deeper learning experiences. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and I hope that you'll be able to continue to watch more fantastic webinars presented here by the Light Center at Westcliff University.